Let's talk about tonight is we're going to have a look at a, a bit more in-depth study of meditation. Now, this is a two-part class. The first part we're going to talk about uh, purpose of meditation, stages of meditation, and we'll look at some guidelines as well. Uh, here's an interesting quote to begin with. Only when the projector, in other words, the eye is completely absent, then befalls the silence, which is not a product of the mind. The silence is inexhaustible. It is not of time. It is immeasurable. Only then arise that which is. Now, we've talked about this before, but we know that the projector is, of course, the ego, the thing that's responsible for the endless train of thoughts and images and things that fly through our mind continually, okay, which, of course, we, in the mystic studies, associate with the I, the ego. Only when the ego is completely absent, then befalls a different state of consciousness, the silence which is not a product of the mind. That silence is inexhaustible, it is not a time, it is immeasurable, only then arrives that which is. With that, we could call it the perception of the truth, we could call it reality, we could call it God, we could call it Allah, we could call it Brahma, whatever you want to call it. It's the same kind of a, a concept. We've talked about this before. We've said that our mind is like a room full of people screaming for our attention. There's thousands of people in this room, and in the corner of that room is that small child, and that small child representing the consciousness. I'm competing with this one over here. That small child represents the consciousness. Now, normally we can't hear that small child because of all the other people screaming. With the process of meditation, we can shut everybody else up in the room so we can focus on what that small child has to say. And that's really what we're talking about here, that silence being the voice of the higher self. What's going on here? Okay, so what is the purpose of meditation? Uh, meditation, we could say, is the daily bread of the wise. One of the things that we look at uh, later on, we talk about the Lord's prayers. is really interesting, kind of a very, it's something simple that everybody thinks of, but it's a really complex prayer with all kinds of different attributes in it. Give us a state, our daily bread. One of the ways that in the Gnostic path we look at that daily bread, we look at that as meditation. Just like we need physical nourishment to keep the body going, we need a different type of nourishment to keep the essence, the consciousness fed. And that nourishment that feeds the essence of the consciousness is meditation. Meditation has all kinds of purposes and benefits. From a really physical point, it's useful for physical and mental relaxation. Um, we also see meditation being used as a door to exploring higher dimensions so that we can access different states of consciousness and the different higher dimensions. This one's interesting because nowadays there's a lot of psychologists and even some medical professionals that are almost prescribing meditation for various things. Things like stress and high blood pressure and stuff like that. If you have a, a challenge with this stuff, they'll even um, prescribe meditation to you. I went through this phase of clenching my jaw at night. I'd fall asleep and subconsciously be clenching my jaw. And I mentioned it to my dentist that I was getting worried, you know, damaging my teeth and stuff like that. And he said, oh, I've got the best prescription for that. It's like meditation. I was like, I don't think it worked. <laughs> but uh, we see that being used a lot for that reason. And most people, when they approach meditation, and now especially in the, the you know, new pseudo-esoteric New Age movement that we see, that's really the only way people actually approach meditation is just looking for physical mental relaxation. But there's much more. Uh, it allows us to get a greater awareness of ourselves, allows us to study ourselves more intensely, and allows us to study our egos as well. Okay, so through the process of meditation, now that we've been able to turn off the egos and communicate more with our higher self, it allows us to arrive at a different perspective of ourself. We can also use meditation to arrive at a deeper understanding of teachings by bringing the knowledge from the intellect to the consciousness where the true meaning can be grasped. Many of the world's books, if it's something simple as the Bible, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, the Popol Vuh, the Torah, Talmud, whatever, all these, these great books of the world, they were written in a certain fashion. They weren't meant to be taken literally. Okay, there's all kinds of problems on the face of the earth because people attempt to take these great teachings like the Bible and interpret them literally. The way those books were written, it was meant to bypass the intellect and speak directly to the consciousness. Okay? By meditating on various verses or chapters or sections of the world's great books, we can almost absorb the consciousness or absorb the, the, the way that uh, information was written and arrive at a different meaning, arrive at a deeper understanding. Okay? So many of the world's books weren't simply meant to be read like novels, they were meant to be meditated on. 
They are meant to be read a verse at a time or a chapter at a time and then spend time contemplating, meditating to arrive at the true meaning. To take that knowledge and incorporate it into our consciousness. Bypassing the intellect and allowing the book to speak directly to the consciousness. While our ego is active, what happens is we read something like the Bible and it's the ego that's interpreting that. So we have our own subjectivities as a result of that. What we want to do ideally is bypass the intellect and bring that knowledge directly to the consciousness where that knowledge can be assimilated on a different level. Meditation is a useful tool for that. Uh, one of the key things for meditation that people usually try to achieve as well is experience what's known as the religious ecstasy, the samadhi, or the experience of the truth. Okay? Um, we can use meditation for something like a door to exploring the higher dimensions, like astral projection, but we can also go to the, the, the holy grail of meditation, which is the direct experience of the truth basically penetrating really high into the higher dimensions, going beyond the astral, beyond the mental, beyond the council plane, and penetrating quite deeply into the higher dimensions. Okay, that was a, a key experience that people uh, attempted to achieve. Basically, it's a, it's a strange thing to describe, but it's, it's, we've talked before about how we're like a small drop pulled out of that great ocean. When we achieve the samadhi, that's like merging back into that great ocean and taking part in that force again. Okay, or finding ourselves, you know, as that small grain of sand being deposited back on that great beach where we can feel everything around us, we can feel one, we can merge basically into the entire universe. Okay, it's a strange experience, you can kind of liken it to being one with all things. Okay, we've heard, you know, God is everywhere and everything. And through the religious ecstasy, through the samadhi, we can experience what's that, what that's like. We can experience what it's like to merge back into the source of all things. <clears throat> Meditation at a, at a really basic level, it serves to silence the internal chatter caused by the egos. And that's your greatest challenge when faced with meditation, is simply quieting the mind. It's one of those things that sounds simple to do, okay, quiet your mind, until you actually attempt it. Okay, every meditation technique is really just a tool for concentration, right? We've talked about this before. The whole purpose of concentration is to take control over the intellectual process to quiet that endless train of thought and arrive at a different state of mind, a different state of consciousness. Okay, when we silence that internal chatter, that's the same thing as not identifying with the thoughts the egos produce so we don't remain in that sleepy state. Okay, remember the three-step process of identification, fascination, and then sleep. The ego introduces a thought or an image in our mind, which we then identify with. Now that's become a distraction. Then we begin to fascinate about it. So we think about it, we fantasize, we daydream, we plan. The whole time that process occurs, the, conscious, the consciousness sorry, sleeps profoundly. Okay, identification, fascination, sleep. All those thoughts, those images that are flying through the screen of your mind, they act as a distraction. You identify with them, which causes you to become fascinated with them. When you become fascinated with them, then you're taken out of the present moment. You're taken out of the eternal instant and you find yourself back in the past reliving a memory or, or an experience or you find yourself pulled into the future projecting, daydreaming, planning or contemplating about something that might happen. The whole time that's occurring, your consciousness sleeps profoundly and the whole path um, towards the awakening of consciousness begins by understanding how to turn off the ego. No sleep equals the state of awakened consciousness. And that's what we're trying to achieve on this path, the awakening of the consciousness. How do we awaken the consciousness? We need to remove that which puts it in the sleep state, which is, of course, the ego, the false self, the consciousness representing the true self, the higher self. Okay, we have to turn off the ego so we can work directly with that consciousness. So, ironically, through meditation, although it's really peaceful and relaxing in the physical body sometimes, falls in a state of sleep, we're actually waking up the consciousness through meditation. Okay, remember that three-step process of identification, fascination, and sleep. Ideally, during meditation, we don't want to identify with the thoughts and images that the mind produces. We want to see those thoughts and images just like cars on the street. They simply pass us by. We don't identify with them. Okay, or clouds drifting by in the sky. Normally what happens is those cars drive by and our normal state of mind is to identify with one of those cars, open it up, get inside, and let it take us for a ride. Let the ego take us somewhere into the past or into the future, 
but take us away from the present moment. What we want to do is simply let those thoughts pass without identifying with them by keeping our concentration, by keeping our focus on whatever the practice happens to be. Here's a quote by Immanuel Kant, the most elevated form of thinking is non-thinking. So the most elevated form of thought is no thought. And that's a really strange thing to describe. And because we have so many thoughts flying through our mind, because we have so many emotions and images flying through our mind at a given time, it's really hard to imagine what it's like to have no thoughts. And it's funny because when you think of a state of none thought, it sounds really boring. It sounds like there's nothing going on. But it's actually the exact opposite. When we're able to turn off the thought process, we can discover something else that's been there in the background the entire time. We just haven't noticed it. It's a much more elevated state of being, a much more elevated state of consciousness. And that's why this guy's described the most elevated form of thinking is non-thought. Okay, the most elevated form of thinking occurs when we turn the intellectual center off, when we turn off the egos that are continually projecting all those thoughts and images on the screen of our mind. When we can turn them off, we can experience a much higher state of being, a much higher form of elevated consciousness. There's a connection between the meditation and the ego, which we're going to explore as well. When we achieve stillness and silence of the mind, then the ego becomes absent. Okay? When we quiet the mind, really what that's saying is turn off the projections of the ego. Okay? Quiet the ego or allow the consciousness to take control over the intellectual center. Okay? Because normally the mind, the intellectual center, is a tool of the ego, which generates, remember, the 30 to 40,000 thoughts your average human being experiences a day. What we want to do is take back control of the intellectual center and hand it over to the consciousness to achieve a different state of awareness. Okay? When we achieve that stillness and silence of the mind, which means when we stop identifying with the ego and when we activate that consciousness, then we achieve a different state. That's what we're trying to do with meditation. Only in the absence of ego can we experience ecstasy and true peace. Only in the absence of the ego can we experience that which is real. Only in the absence of the ego can we experience the truth. Okay, that's something that we have to arrive at within our own consciousness. That's why you can't be told what reality is. That's why you can't be, be shown uh, how to arrive at the truth. It's something that you have to do on your own because the ego has to be absent. Okay, we have to learn to turn the ego off to work directly with the consciousness because it's only through, a con through the consciousness that we're going to feel that true peace, that we're going to feel that, 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 that sense of, of contentment and love and ecstasy and all that kind of stuff. It's only through the absence of the ego that we can perceive reality and we can perceive the truth. Once the ego is absent, the essence can free itself and penetrate the superior or the higher worlds. Um, remember the story of Aladdin and the lamp. When the mind is in a passive and receptive state, absolutely still and in silence, the essence is liberated from the mind and the ecstasy arrives. Remember that story of Aladdin and the lamp, where Aladdin finds the lamp and he rubs it in the magical being, the genie popped out. Remember that was just all an analogy for the relationship between the higher self, the soul, the consciousness, it all really means the same thing, and the ego. All the various egos that we have have trapped the consciousness, have trapped the divine spark within us. What we do in meditation is by turning off the egos, we allow that essence to be liberated. Okay, That's just like Aladdin rubbing the lamp. So Aladdin rubbing the lamp is all an analogy for meditation. What happens is the magical being then comes out of the lamp. The lamp represents the prison of the ego. The magical being represents the essence or the consciousness. Okay? The ego acts like uh, a weight or a chain or an anchor that keeps the essence bound in this physical plane. When we learn to silence the mind, when we learn to turn the ego off, that essence can free itself and the first thing that essence does is merge itself back into the higher dimensions. And this is a process that we're entirely aware of. Okay, so we're aware of this happening. We're aware that we've you know, left our body and penetrated into a different state of consciousness. When we go to that higher dimension, we can learn things. We can receive messages. There's all kinds of stuff that we can do up there. Then when we return back to the physical body, we retain the memory of everything that we saw, learned, and did while we were up there. Okay, so when we turn that ego off, 
we allow the essence to free itself and go to a different state, elevating ourselves to a different level of consciousness. Okay, when the mind is in a passive and receptive state, and we've talked about this before, by passive and receptive, we know that means non-reactive. Remember the ego, the normal state of consciousness, is very reactionary. By quieting the mind, by allowing us to work with the consciousness, the consciousness is passive and receptive. Okay, it's not reactive like we see with the ego. Absolutely still and in silence, the essence is liberated from the mind and the ecstasy arrives. The ecstasy is the experience of the essence merging itself into the higher dimensions. Meditation, when you look at it this way, i.e. the state of non-thought, it's a really a way to awaken the essence. Okay, it's really a way to liberate that essence. It's like a workout for the essence. The essence is the same thing as the consciousness, is the same thing as our higher self, same thing as the divine spark, same thing as our soul. So many words that really describe the same experience. So meditation is a way for us to awaken our essence. That's why meditation is the daily bread of the wise. Meditating every day or meditating regularly allows us to grow and develop that essence as well. Okay, the essence is also known as the buddhata or the consciousness. So consciousness, essence, higher self, divine spark, soul, it all really means the same thing. Just different cultures of the world describe that principle that's found within us in a different way. You could think of it as the life force behind everything. You could think of it, of it as the animating principle. It all really means the same thing. In order for us to exist, we require to draw energy from a higher place. That energy from the higher place is the essence. It's the, it's the connection that we have with the divine. Okay, The connection we have with whatever you know created the universe, the originating point of, of everything. Through meditation, in addition to wake, awakening the essence, you learn to control your mind as well. And that's the problem that we have with our mind right now. When it becomes a tool of the ego, it's something that we have no control over. We find it very difficult to control the intellectual process. Okay, It's really hard to stop that endless procession of thoughts. If you're a worrier, for example, it's really hard to stop doing that. Okay, Through meditation, we can learn to take control of the mind and begin to dominate it. Having control of the mind, mental control, permits us to destroy the shackles that are created by the mind. Okay, the mind is a prison for the essence and the consciousness. Okay, it's a prison that we've created ourselves. Through learning to control the intellectual process through the use of meditation, we can basically destroy that prison. We can basically, you know, sever those ties, remove those chains, cut off those weights that keep us bound to this physical dimension, allowing ourselves to penetrate into the higher dimensions to gain the knowledge and experience that's waiting for us up there. When thinking is under control, illumination comes spontaneously. Uh, it's, a little, it's a simple sentence, but there's an important thing to understand in here. When we think of meditation, we think of you know, trying to put ourselves in those higher dimensions. That's actually not the way to look at it. The way we look at meditation is simply to take control of the intellectual center. Our job, our task, is to quiet the mind. Once the mind is completely quiet, then the different state of consciousness comes automatically. Because it's always been there, we just haven't been able to notice it because of all the background noise. Okay? Just like that child in the room, the room of a hundred people and that small child speaking. That child's been speaking the entire time, we just can't hear it. If we shut everybody else up in the room, then we can hear the child. Okay? We can't make the child talk louder, we just have to quiet everybody else in order for us to focus on what was always there. Meditation is the same kind of a thing to think, or you can approach it the same way. It's our job to gain control of the intellectual process. It's our job to quiet the mind. Once the mind is in a still, passive, and receptive state, then that illumination, then that essence frees itself spontaneously. There's nothing we have to do to make the essence free itself. There's nothing we have to do to experience that illumination. It happens of its own accord, provided we've quieted the mind. Okay, so we don't have to put ourselves in the high dimensions. There's nothing we actually have to do there. All we have to do is learn to quiet the mind. Okay, and the first step to quieting the mind is, of course, concentration, which is why for the last nine weeks, you're sick of hearing me say concentration, 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 over and over again. 
Okay, that's why all the practices we've been doing every week, their sole purpose was to develop concentration. Because it's through concentration that we gain control of the intellectual process. Once we bring ourselves to that level where we can focus and keep concentrated for an extended period of time, then that illumination comes spontaneously of its own accord. Our mind is a prison. We must dominate our mind if we want to become independent of it. Okay? Unfortunately, we've fallen into this kind of trap where we think that our mind controls us. The thoughts, the emotions, the things that are generated almost seem to come from outside of us, and it's something that we seem to have no control over. Okay? That's why we have things like mood swings and all that kind of stuff. We have to look at it this way. The mind is a prison. This is something that we want to break free from. We have to learn to dominate it. And the key to dominating the mind is simply willpower. Okay, the strength and willpower it takes to do the practices to learn to take control over our mind. It's just like if you wanted to learn to play piano, you need the willpower to actually learn and then start to practice. Okay, no matter what skill you want to acquire, it's a matter of willpower and perseverance to arrive at your goal. Control of the mind is the same thing. It's something that can be done by anybody that wants to take the time to learn some techniques and persevere with the practice to develop the techniques. This is the symbolism behind Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey on Palm Sunday. Okay, we look at the story in the Bible of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey on Palm Sunday, and we see some important symbolism here. The donkey was always an ancient symbol for the mind, because donkeys are stubborn or misbehaving and don't do what they're told. That's the same thing as our mind. Jesus riding that donkey was the representation of control, the willpower. Jerusalem represents the superior worlds, the higher dimensions. Okay, so we have to follow Jesus' example. Okay, he was the, the master in that case, the consciousness riding the donkey into the higher dimensions. That's what we want to do with meditation. Take control of the donkey and ride it into our own Jerusalem, the superior worlds. Unfortunately, most of the time, our donkey rides us and doesn't take us anywhere. Okay, he's running around in circles. Okay, so there's just a, a, an interesting little sentence to think at. When we look at it from this perspective, um, we see Jesus illustrating the importance of dominance of the mind. Okay, controlling the intellectual center. Through controlling the intellectual center, then you can steer yourself towards the superior worlds, the higher dimensions. Okay, and unfortunately for most of us, normally our donkeys running around laughing, riding us while we ferry our donkey everywhere. The donkey representing the intellectual center under control of the ego, the false self, the I. Through meditation, we can also learn to eliminate our egos. Meditation becomes a really powerful tool in elimination of the egos. We'll spend more time talking about that at a later class. Okay, but for right now, what we can do is we can meditate on a specific psychological defect we discover through self-observation to fully comprehend that defect. So let's say you find yourself in a situation where you're working with self-observation and you discover the ego of anger in a particular situation. Well, what you can do at some point is go into a state of meditation and really study that ego of anger. Study its manifestation in you. Okay? Bring the knowledge of that anger to a different level. Just like earlier, we talked about studying the world's great books and not simply reading them, but meditating on them to fully assimilate that knowledge. I'm talking about something similar here. Finding a situation where perhaps there's something uh, not so pleasant happened, where we really lost our temper and caused a problem in, in a relationship or something like that. We can go into meditation to study that ego, to study why it was we acted that way, why we did the things that we did or said the things that we said and really try to bring that knowledge of the ego to a much deeper level, okay? Because oftentimes, a certain situation, when we look at it, can seem like it's related to one ego or another, but the more we reflect on it, the more we meditate on the situation, we can discover there was other egos acting, okay? So we can use meditation as a tool to penetrate the hidden side of our psychology, which is what we talked about last week, right? Getting to the, the dark side of our psychology, getting into our subconsciousness, we can use the ego as a tool to eliminate that. Because through meditation, that consciousness really starts to grow and really starts to develop and really starts to shine brightly. And we can use the extra you know, power of the consciousness, if you want to think of it that way, to probe even deeper into our subconscious. We can use the light of the consciousness, make it shine brighter, to illuminate more of those dark corners of the mind.
remembering that we've got the process, we've got self-observation, which allows us to identify an ego. After identification, we then comprehend, study the ego through meditation, and then the final step is elimination. We have to use self-observation to identify the various egos. Then through meditation and contemplation, we have to comprehend fully and understand the egos. Once we've done that, we can then get to the state where we eliminate the ego, permanently remove it from our psychology. We have to be able to fully comprehend an ego in all levels of the mind before we can eliminate it. Meditation is the tool that we use to penetrate deeper into the various levels of the mind. Okay, your mind is kind of like an onion. There's stuff on the surface, but you peel it back and there's more and more layers. Okay, think of your mind as an onion with 49 layers on it. We use meditation to peel back those layers to go deeper and deeper to find the root cause of all our egos. To penetrate right back to the source, because when we get to that point, then we can fully eliminate the ego. Okay, but meditation is an important part of that process. So let's have a look at what happens during meditation. Let's break the whole process of meditation down very really simply. Uh, during meditation, as we mentioned, we can temporarily unbottle our essence from the prison of the ego. We find a state where we can temporarily turn the ego off, turn the mind off, allowing that essence to free itself and penetrate into the higher dimensions. Okay, remember that whole story of Aladdin and the genie. That's a really important story. It sounds like such a simple children's tale, but there's a lot of gnosis, there's a lot of wisdom hidden in that teaching. Okay, the egos act like the lamp. The genie is the essence, the consciousness. Through meditation, we want to unbottle that essence. We want to liberate that consciousness. Remembering that free, our essence, or our higher self, enters the superior worlds. The superior worlds, you could call the higher dimensions. You could also call them the heavens. It all means the same thing. Okay? We've talked about this before, but we know there's many higher dimensions that exist above us. Okay, we're sitting right now in the first three dimensions. Above that is the vital or the mental plane. Oh, sorry, the vital or the etheric plane. Then we have the mental, oh, sorry, the astral, the mental, the causal, the buddhic, the atmic, and then even higher worlds beyond that as well. Meditation is the tool that allows ourselves to penetrate into those higher dimensions. We can't go there. We have the ego. The ego is like an anchor. It holds us back from reaching anywhere beyond the lower versions of the astral. Okay, basically the highest we can go with the ego is where we find ourselves in the fifth dimension, the astral and the mental. We can't get any higher until we sever the ties that we have with the ego by learning to turn the ego off, allowing that essence to free itself. With meditation, we're able to gradually bring the mental process to a pause. Okay, this is what we're trying to do. It's something that we have to work up to. It's not going to happen instantaneously. Through meditation, the early stages of meditation, we're bringing the intellectual process to a pause. We're slowing down that endless train of thoughts. We can't stop them instantly straight away. We have to work them to come to a, to a pause, slowing things down. With practice, those pauses in thought become longer and longer, allowing us to enter into a peaceful silence that has no mental words or images attached. Okay, and that sounds like no mental words or images. You can't even imagine what that state of mind is. It's also very difficult to describe to somebody as well. When people say, well, what's it like to have a state of not thought? Or what's it like to experience samadhi? Like, why can't you tell me about it kind of thing? Um, the best analogy I can give is, uh, I probably said this to you before, um, how would you describe color to a blind person? Uh, every word you want to use, there's no way to express that because they can't speak the same vocabulary because they haven't seen it. Describing a state of mind that has no mental words or images attached, you do the same thing. It's like, uh, you end up sounding weird by saying, it's like everything but nothing. It's like being everywhere yet being nowhere. You just end up with all these contradictory statements because there's really no vocabulary to describe something that has no words. Okay, or no mental images associated. It's something that you have to strive to experience yourself, but it's definitely associated with a very peaceful and blissful state. Not peaceful as in relaxing on the couch kind of thing, not peaceful as in having a good time, but a total different kind of peace, almost like a, a mental relaxation. Okay, you can relax your physical body fairly easily, but it's like relaxing the mind. It's a very different state of being. It's a very a calming, peaceful, blissful kind of state. 
Now we say no mental words or images attached, which makes it sound like it's boring and nothing. It's so much more than that. It's so much more than what the simple nothing. Because there's no mental words or images attached, therefore something else flourishes. Something else is in its place. Once our thoughts stop, the essence can temporarily free itself from the ego and go to superior worlds. So we're going to try to bring that mental process to a pause. Once we finally get those thoughts to stop, that's the point where the essence breaks free and liberates itself. Okay? When it breaks free and liberates itself, that's the state known as samadhi, or the religious ecstasy. That's the, the holy grail of meditation. Okay? That's where the essence penetrates quite high into the superior dimension. So we go beyond the world of the astral. We go beyond the world of the mental. We go to a really high state of existence. Let's try to explain this in a picture form, because it makes it easier. This is your normal state of mind, okay? The normal state of mind is continuous random thoughts, okay? So you're, you're thinking about what you're going to do over Christmas, you're thinking about what happened last Christmas, you're thinking about you got to get milk when the class is done, you're thinking about uh, what's going to happen this weekend, whether or not to get a Christmas tree. Each of these arrows represents a random thought that's flying somewhere in your mind right now. That's the normal state of human consciousness, just thoughts flying everywhere. Thoughts and images about the past, about the future, about the present. It's just a jumbled mess. Okay, This is the normal state of consciousness you find yourself in during your average day. The whole purpose of a meditation is to turn that into this. That's concentration. Concentration is a single thought held for a purpose. That could be a concentration on something like the candle flame that we looked at. That could be concentration on your heartbeat. That could be concentration on a mantra or sound. That could be concentration of a chakra in your body. It doesn't matter. Every meditation practice, no matter what it is, is trying to get you to this point. It's giving you something to focus on. It's giving you something to hold on to while you try to turn off all this other stuff. Because there's that thing you want to focus, but it's lost amongst all the noise. We want to turn off all this noise, oops, just to get down to that single point. That's why I've been harping on you so much about concentration. Okay? Because normally you're trying to do this in the meditation, and then, oh, I wonder what time it is. Oh, we're well, supposed to be concentrating on the candle flame. Oh, what am I going to do over Christmas? This line keeps being interrupted by other thoughts that are trying to take you away from that point. Okay? That's the mind fighting. The mind wants to be here because this is what the egos want. They want you to identify with all these things. What we're trying to do is hold through that a single thought with a purpose. Every meditation practice, no matter from what background it is, what school, what discipline, that's all it's trying to do. Okay? Arrive at that point. That is all you need to do. Once you can hold that single thought for an extended period of time, something interesting happens. While you're sitting there thinking about that candle flame and really holding the image of the candle flame firmly in your mind and not allowing anything else to come in, something really interesting happens. We start to see these gaps in the thought process. Those gaps are the points where the essence frees itself. Those gaps are the most elevated form of thought, the stages of non-thought, where we can experience a different state of consciousness. You can't go from here to here without getting through here. Okay? You don't do this. You don't make those thoughts appear. They happen on their own spontaneously. You have to do this. This is the part that takes active action. Okay? During the early stages of meditation, we find ourselves flipping basically between these two states. Right? You're thinking the candle flame, or thinking the heartbeat, or thinking the mantra, thinking the mantra, and then you end up back here. And then you're there, and you oh, I'm supposed to think about the mantra. So you go back here, and then you go back there, and then you go back here, and it's like a tug of war between these two states. If you keep that tug of war up through perseverance and willpower, eventually you spend more time here and less time there, and eventually you stay here. And then when you stay here, eventually you jump to the next stage, which is this point here. Okay? That's why I've spent so much time harping on you about meditation. That's why in the middle of the meditation sometime I say, remember to concentrate. You're supposed to be concentrating on whatever. Okay? Because that's what you're trying to do. Hold this thought for as long as you can. Whether that thought being a mantra, whether it being a visualization like the plant one that we did, or the candle flame, whether it's your heartbeat, it doesn't matter. Okay, The whole purpose of all the various practices is to develop this ability right here. The ability to keep your mind firmly focused on a single thought without deviating. 
because if you can hold it on a single thought without deviating, this is what happens spontaneously. Okay, suddenly there's breaks in that thought process where you experience a different state of being, a different state of consciousness. It can't go from here to here. You can't make those breaks happen. All you can do is this point right here. Okay, and that's why concentration is such an important tool, and this comes with practice. Okay, that's why ideally if we can practice uh, 15, 20 minutes, once or twice a day, then we're going to see progress if we can keep that up. If we sporadically practice, you know, once every couple of weeks, then it's not going to be that easy to do. It's going to take us a lot longer to reach our goal. In the absence of the ego, we experience what is real. We experience the truth which is not of time. When we penetrate ourselves into those higher dimensions, we basically go outside of time. Remember the time is basically the fourth dimension. You've got length, width, and height, the first three dimensions. The fourth dimension is time. During meditation, we're actually able to transcend or go outside of time. Okay, it allows us to experience what is real, it allows us to experience the truth. The ego acts like a filter or a lens through which we perceive reality. Okay, the ego is like a pair of really dirty glasses that are all scratched and dirty and out of focus. But that's how we've perceived all of reality. Through meditation, in the absence of the ego, that's like taking those dirty glasses off and being able to see the true reality of the world. Okay, the ego distorts or filters everything around us, and we're not even aware of it because we don't know what it's like to be without the ego. Through meditation, it's like taking that filter off, taking that distortion away, allowing us to see what is really there, allowing us to experience directly the truth. Okay, that's why you may have heard things like everything you see before you is an illusion. It doesn't really exist like this. It's not really here. It's just something that you've created. Okay, it's just a distraction created by the ego and an attempt for you to keep sustaining and feeding the ego. Okay? Through the absence of the ego with meditation, we can experience firsthand what's really there. We can experience firsthand directly the truth. Okay? And that's why the truth is not something we can be told. It's not something we're ever going to read. It's something that we have to experience. When we look at the stories of the great masters like Jesus and Buddha, uh, when Jesus' disciples asked him, you know, Master, what is the truth? Jesus simply turned and walked away. When the Buddha's disciples asked him, Master, what is truth? Buddha just stood there and remained silent. What these masters were trying to tell us is, you have to experience this. The ego has to be gone. You're never going to know what reality and what truth is while the lens of the ego is there, distorting all the information that comes to you. We basically gather all our information through the five senses, but before that reaches the mind, the ego intervenes on all of that, okay, and distorts it or alters it or colors it to suit its own purposes. Okay, we've all experienced things like that before. We've all experienced things in our lives where the ego has basically distorted the information in an attempt to get a particular reaction out of us or in an attempt to, for us to identify in a particular way. When the ego is gone, therefore, we remove the subjectivity of the mind and see things as they really are. Okay, and that's a really important thing to understand. Everything that we do, we simply react to the world. The image that we construct of the world as well, everything you see before you is simply a reaction to the various forms of energy in this room. Okay, and then just think, think, think about, right, everything you see before you, where does it actually exist? It exists in your mind, right? Because it's your mind's interpretation of various frequencies of light. Okay, so the exterior world is not so external as people think. Everything you see before you has been constructed and built inside your mind. Your mind just interpreted various frequencies and wavelengths of light and created a picture. Okay, so when we go into a deep state of meditation, when we eliminate the ego, we remove that subjectivity, we remove that filter, and it allows us to perceive reality as it really is. In deep meditation, we can reach a high state where we can experience what's known as the illuminated void. And the illuminated void is the samadhi, the religious ecstasy. Illuminated void, it's think of a, a void of nothing, but illumination full of everything. Okay, it's basically sometimes you think of it as that limitless light or nothing yet everything kind of experience. Okay? The void, you could call that truth. You could call it Zen. You could call it Brahma. You could call it Allah. You could call it God. It was all just a description of the same thing. 
Okay, so arriving at, uh, arriving at the state of Zen, okay, or, or looking at this, you know, like we talk about, uh, for example, the Tao talks about a different state of consciousness, consciousness as well. It's all an expression of the same thing. Different religions and different cultures of the world describe that experience in different terms, but it was all the same thing. It was all an experience of what is known as the illuminated void. Taking that essence, that small spark that we are, and allowing ourselves to temporarily merge back with that source and undergo an exchange of energy or an exchange of information. Okay, you can think of it that way. Plugging ourselves back in to recharge the batteries. Okay, merging back with that source. It's an experience which is indescribable with human language and range of feelings. It's one of those catch-22s as well. It's one of those sort of, you know, describing color to a blind person. It's something that's not, the language doesn't exist. It's one of those experiences that if it happens, it's extremely profound and life-changing. Okay, it's basically the, the sense of being at one with all things, merging into all of reality, whether it be other people, whether it be nature, animals, rocks, water, trees, merging into the universal life force of everything, merging back to the source of all things and experiencing that state and being able to come back and remember everything that we experienced. In the void, we experience what is real. We experience the truth. Okay, sometimes going to the void feels like waking up, and coming back from that experience, coming back to the physical body and the physical world feels very much like going to sleep. Okay, and it's kind of a, it can be, it's a, a, a pleasurable thing, but it also is, is, it can be somewhat confusing to think that this was the reality and now this feels like the dream and where I was felt like the reality. And if that's the reality and this is the dream, well, what does that mean? <laughs> so it's that kind of a, an experience. Okay, the interesting thing is no matter what happens to us when we're there, we return to the physical body retaining the memory of all that we have seen and felt, all that we have learned, all that we have experienced, we've been able to bring back to us in the physical body. And it's funny too because going to that place, it's not so much learning as it is remembering. Okay, that's the other interesting aspect as well. It's a, it's a place that's so strange yet so familiar all at the same time, an overwhelming sense of deja vu, almost an overwhelming sense of, of, of going home, of going where you're supposed to be. When we look at the process of meditation, we can break it down into five phases as well, or five steps or levels to the process of meditation. Okay, so we can take the process of meditation and break it down into five phases. The first phase is what was classically called the asana. And the asana is simply assuming a comfortable position. Now there's all kinds of different asanas depending on which school or discipline you're looking at. Some asanas from the various eastern schools are almost really painful. They're almost like strange kind of ways to put your legs or really painful ways to contort the body. They were designed to be painful. Your body is a huge distraction to meditation. Because while you keep focused on your physical body, you keep focused on the prison of the mind. Okay? Part of meditation is being able to let go of the physical body. We've all done this before in the meditation where you've got to shift your weight, you've got to move your butt, shift your leg, or you feel the dreaded itch and you've got to eventually scratch it. That's all a distraction. We know those physical sensations are distractions created by the ego in the motor center in an attempt to bring our concentration and draw our focus back to the physical body. While our focus is on the physical body, we stay in the physical body. Okay, so the first phase of meditation is finding a comfortable position. Some of the uh, uh, oriental asanas, they weren't designed to be comfortable, they were designed to be so incredibly uncomfortable that your mind would just totally want to break free from the physical body. Okay, you don't have to go to that extreme, you don't have to do all these strange postures if you don't want to. All that you have to do to maintain that comfortable position is a state of relaxation. Whatever you need to be relaxed. If it's lying down in the bed, lie down in bed. If it's sitting in your easy chair, sitting in the easy, sit in the easy chair. If it's sitting cross-legged on a bearskin rug, sit cross-legged on a bearskin rug. If crossing your legs bothers you, prefer to lie down, then lie down. Okay? If you're from another discipline where you've been taught it's you know, really weird to stand like this for hours on end, then stand like that for hours on end. It doesn't really matter. It's a personal thing. The whole point is to relax the physical body, to place the body in a state where it will no longer distract us. Okay? Some of the asanas went the opposite extreme. It produced so much discomfort 
that you are forced to abandon the physical body. Okay, but we don't have to go to those those lengths if we don't want to, especially if we're not, you know, able to contort ourselves into weird positions. Just assuming a comfortable position. I shopped around until I found a nice chair, a chair that would tilt the right way and felt nice to me and just supported my body in all the ways I wanted supported, so I could relax. Okay, a nice sometimes a nice big fluffy bean bag kind of chair works as well. Whatever you want, whatever works for you. The idea being, you have to be able to relax the physical body so you aren't distracted. That's why the first time every time we do a meditation, we sit down and spend a few minutes to relax the body. Okay, working with a complete breath to bring in a different state of relaxation to the physical body. Because after we've relaxed the physical body, the next stage of meditation, sorry, getting ahead of myself. The key to remember though, once you relax the physical body, is you have to be still. Once you achieve that state of relaxation, don't give in. Okay? When you feel that itch, don't scratch it. When you feel that urge to shift your weight, don't do that. Okay? In the, the Orient, we used to sit cross-legged. Here, you don't have to do that. You can lie down, you can sit, you can do whatever you want. But the key is, once you enter that relaxed state, you can't move. Okay? Your body will want to move. That's the ego attempting to distract you. Okay? Fight the urge to scratch the itch. Fight the urge to shift your weight. I like to think of it like, like a wall. It slowly builds, the itch or the sensation move gets so intense, you're like, I'm going to lose it, I got to scratch, I got to scratch, I got to scratch. If you finally push beyond that, it disappears and goes away. There's like a, a wall that you have to get to. Okay, once you get to that wall, then you start to lose sensation of your physical body. Sometimes it begins like you, you can't feel your feet or you can't feel your hands. And you want to you want to move them to suddenly, you know, you get this sense of I can't feel my hands, I don't know what the orientation of them is, so you want to move to reestablish that orientation. You've just lost it. Okay, eventually you want that sensation to spread through your entire body, so you lose sense of your physical body. It doesn't even feel like it's there anymore. That's what you're trying to do. Okay? After assuming, after, sorry, arriving at a state of comfort with the physical body, that brings us to the next phase, the blanking of our mind, something that was referred to as the pratyahara. And at this particular stage, what we're trying to do is remove the thoughts, okay? What I like to pretend to do, this is just my tip, you might like it, you might not, is you can pretend your mind is like a whiteboard. And you can pretend you just come in and you erase everything that's on it. You pretend all your thoughts and everything is like laid out before you on a blackboard, go in and erase them, okay? Or you can pretend it's like a tabletop cluttered with all the thoughts and stresses and worries and go in with your arm and sweep them all off. Okay, you want to remove all that stuff, okay? That's why I say, sometimes when we meditate, leave all your worries and distractions at the door. We'll pick them up on the way off. Just drop them over there and say, I'll come deal with them when I'm done. Before we can concentrate, you have to have a blank slate. You have to have nothing to distract you. So you have to put aside all those thoughts and worries and, you know, make a little, almost like a little pact with yourself. Okay, I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to worry about that in 20 minutes and half an hour. Okay, but you want to wipe all that crap off, all that stuff that's been bugging you all day, the stuff that's been eating away at the back of your mind, worrying about Christmas and buying people gifts and all that kind of stuff, and just sweep it out of the way and say, I'm not going to deal with this right now. Okay, that was, that's the blanking phase. You can think of it as like a blackboard or a television screen that there's nothing on, whatever you want to do. The next phase of meditation is the concentration phase, the dharana. And the concentration phase is the one that we've been talking about before, learning to focus the mind on only one thought. So we relax the physical body, then we relax the mind. Okay? Once the mind is relaxed, then we can concentrate. Okay? We have to, when we're in that concentration phase, we can't identify with any thoughts, and we can't identify with any sensations of the physical body either, because we want to hold that single thought for as long as we can. Focusing the mind on everything within, almost like shutting off all our senses, shutting off everything and going internally. Because usually when we think of the higher dimensions, we kind of think of going out of the body, we're going out or up or something like that. Ironically, we go out by going in. We almost want to not fold our, our consciousness and awareness out, but direct it in all the way down to a very small point. Think of ourselves as imploding down to a single point. That's what we're trying to do. Focusing on our inner self separating ourselves from those mundane earthly thoughts, all those distractions and stresses of everyday life, stop worrying about all that and just directing our awareness internally. That's why during meditation we've been doing the heart temple thing. 
focusing on our heart and going inside ourself to a point that's inside ourself, a point of connection that we find within ourself. That's to accomplish this phase right here. Okay, remember the whole purpose of concentration is thinking one thought with a purpose. You're thinking one thought and wondering what time it is and wondering if you need milk on the way home and wondering what you're going to do for Christmas, then you're not concentrating. You've got to hold that single thought for as long as you can. The fourth phase, the introversion, the dhyana phase, comes after meditation. And this is, this is the profound reflection on the content. This is where we lead up to those pauses in that thought process. Okay, so we big, begin the concentration and then we hold it as long as we can. This is the actual, the meditation. This is those pauses in the thought process. Okay, this is the most elevated form of thought, the non-thought. The introversion thought where we've completely cut ourselves off and focused only on that single thought for so long that we bring about the new state, the state of dhyana. And then the fifth stage, sorry, state of meditation, the state of non-thinking, the true stillness of the mind, because after we reach that, then we find ourselves submerged in the fifth state, which is the ecstasy, the samadhi, which is the entering of the superior worlds. Okay, so step one, quiet the body. Step two, clear the mind. Step three, relax the mind. Hold that thought for as long as we can. Step four, experience that state of non-thought, the breaks in the thought process. Step five, submersion in the higher dimensions. Okay, but the, it has to happen in that order. You've got to relax the physical body first. If you don't relax the physical body, you're uncomfortable, you're distracted, you'll never get beyond step three. Okay, so we start by relaxing the physical body, then we move to relaxing the mind, then we move to concentrating on the, the meditation itself. The concentration on the meditation brings about the dhyana state, brings about that elevated form of thought, that brings about the samadhi. This is what we're trying to achieve. These two things happen of their own accord. Okay, this is what we have to hold. The concentration is the hard one. Relaxation of the physical body, it can be a little bit tricky at first, but you can quickly get the hang of that. And that's why, of course, working with proper breathing technique is so important in meditation as well. Through proper breathing technique, we can learn to relax the body. Okay, we can learn to have that excess of oxygen that allows our muscles to relax and allows our, our heart rate to slow down and our blood pressure to drop and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, you can't skip the relaxation. If you try to skip the relaxation and don't spend time to properly relax the body, then the body just becomes a distraction during the entire time. You, mid, you fidget, you move, you shift, you get itchy, and you're never be able to pass this state. Okay, it's funny to say, but learning to relax the body takes practice as well. And you know what? The more you do it, the better you get at it, and the quicker you can get into the state. Okay, if you do a lot of meditation and you learn to properly relax the physical body, you can be at work and be stressed out and just simply, you know, look away from the computer and take a couple deep breaths and drop your body right back into the state of relaxation and actually feel all that tension and stress drip away. It's a really powerful technique just to, just for the health of the physical body, for blood pressure and stress levels, because when you're stressed, you release all kinds of hormones and chemicals, which cause all kinds of problems in the body, right? So learning to relax, relax the body is a, a really powerful tool in itself, and it's one that's definitely worth doing. If you try to skip that, then the whole time you're doing the meditation, you're not wrestling with your mind, you're wrestling with your physical body, okay? Uh, let's look at some guidelines for meditation. Um, this is an obvious one, practice with your eyes closed. That's necessary to shut out the external world, okay? Most people do this instinctively, um, but it's, it's an obvious one as well, but you're trying to cut off as much distraction as possible, so obviously close your eyes. Uh, you have to be absolutely relaxed. I've just been talking about that and I can't stress that enough, okay? You have to put the physical body to sleep. The key to deep states of meditation can be described as four words. Mind awake, body asleep. That's what we're going for. A different state of consciousness is arrived at when we can let our physical body fall to sleep but keep the mind focused. Okay, the wise co combination of meditation and drowsiness. We have to learn to provoke and regulate the sleepy state by will. Because that drowsy state, that half awake, half asleep state, that's called the hypnagogic state. That's something that the medical community recognizes. We can put ourselves in that state. When somebody is in that state, the brain does specific activity. There's something called the theta wave brain activity that's actually occurring 
at that point that's not quite awake, not quite asleep. Interestingly enough, people that are uh, psychic and have abilities like astral projection and stuff like that, they can be measured, and when they're in those states, that's the brainwave activity they're producing, the theta brainwave state. Another interesting aspect of that, young children produce a lot of that. The older we get, as we grow up to go from a child to an adult, the less and less time our brain spends doing that theta activity. The less and less time our brain spends in that hypnagogic state. That's why young children is susceptible to a lot of influences. They can interact with all kinds of entities and beings and intelligences. They can perceive things in different dimensions that we as adults have lost the ability to do. Okay, that sleepy state, the, the state that I like to call napping on the couch in the afternoon, that's the hypnagogic state. That's, all, that's a window to the higher dimensions. That's the state we're trying to bring on in meditation. Keeping the mind focused, yet letting the body relax and slip into a sleep state. Okay, because when we slip into that sleep state, we find our consciousness outside of our physical body, which we can then use to go into astral projection or penetrating the mental plane or the calcial plane or wherever it is that we want to go. <clears throat> Your physical body won't sleep unless it's relaxed. So if you're really uncomfortable and fidgeting and scratching, it's like tossing and turning in bed all night. You're not going to be able to reach that sleepy state. Uh, another key for meditation is you have to do it regularly. Okay, you have to practice. It's like if you were not here to learn about meditation tonight, let's say you're here for your first piano lesson, you're here for your first guitar lesson. If you want to be any good at it, you're going to have to practice. You're going to have to put some effort into it. Okay? Be consistent and regular in your practice. Have tenacity and perseverance. If you have the option and the ability, set aside an area of your house for your meditation space. And make it symbolic in that when you walk in that space and close the door or draw the curtain, it's like shutting yourself off from the external world in the mundane. Okay? Make yourself a little ritual out of it. When you light the candle, when you light the incense, make that symbolic for a switch, a different state of consciousness. If you can do that, if you can dedicate the same space with perhaps a certain type of music you like, perhaps a certain instance, these are all cues that you can use to help put you in that state quicker. So when you practice every day, simply the act of going in your meditation room, closing the door, lighting the candle, you can already feel your body start to anticipate that change of consciousness. Just simply going in that room allows you to relax. Okay? It doesn't even have to be a separate room. It can be a corner of a room. Okay, it can be a little place that you set up a little corner in your living room or somewhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be private, but just a place that you can make symbolic of meditation. When you go there, it's for one purpose and one purpose only, to meditate, to quiet the mind, and associate that place with peace and relaxation and whatever. Okay, I have a, a room in my house that I use, and I stop myself before I walk through the door, and I won't let myself bring anything in there. So whatever stress, whatever's bothering me, whatever's worrying me, I say I'm leaving it out here, I'm not bringing this in the room, and then I step through the threshold and I close the door, and I imagine I just closed all that outside of me. And this room is like a little protective space, and when I'm in there, I'm relaxed and I'm focused, and I don't worry about the external world. When I'm done my meditation, I walk back out, it's like, okay, bring it back. You know, let's, let's go solve that problem, or let's worry about Christmas or whatever it is that we need to deal with. But for the time I was in that room, I wasn't associating with any of that kind of stuff. I wasn't identifying with those thoughts. Those without patience and perseverance will never achieve the ecstasy, will never achieve the realization of the truth. Okay? It, we're not talking about like decades of practice, we're not even talking about years of practice. You can have experiences in a relatively short period of time if you're going to put the effort into it. Okay, but just like, as I mentioned, if we're all here to learn piano, uh, the ones that would be learning the quickest would be the ones that we're practicing the most. You know, you want to play some of uh, Beethoven's greatest works on piano, you're going to have to practice a couple times a week. Okay, it's just the same as anything else in life. If you're expecting instant results, uh, this isn't the path for people that, that, that think like that. And remembering that that also is related to a particular ego. Uh, you have to develop concentration. I know you're so sick of me saying that, but that's the key. In, in anticipation of doing all these exciting things like astral projection and remembering past lives, everyone wants to run before they learn to walk. Concentration is the walking. If we don't develop that, if we don't learn to dominate the mind, then we can't achieve any of those states. We can't view the Akashic records of our past lives. We can't go into the mental plane, the astral plane. We can't, you know, experience the state of Samadhi. None of that comes without the concentration. That's what we have to actively try to do. And it's so easy to forget. It's so easy to go into a meditation 
and let's say we start a mantra and we're visualizing the mantra, it's so easy 15, 20 minutes into that mantra to be sitting in your chair making a sound while your mind is somewhere else. It's so easy to slip into that state because that's the state where we spend almost our entire lives. You have to fight for that state of concentration. It's a battle. It's a war. It's a tug of war with your own mind. You have to keep pulling it in the direction you want to go. You have to take a whip to that donkey to dominate the mind so you can climb on top of that donkey and start steering it in the right direction. <clears throat> the intellect must assume a receptive, tranquil state. Observe your mind and thoughts, but don't identify with them. Okay, like cars on the road, there they go, they just pass you by, you don't wave the car down, get inside, and let you take it for a ride. Okay, you can't just flip a switch and make them stop, they're going to come, but you have to not identify with them. When you start to not identify with them, the ego gets creative. It tries even harder to distract you. So next thing you know, you've got memories you haven't even thought of in years suddenly popping up. Strange images or scenes popping up in your mind. Okay, all this stuff is an attempt to get your attention. An attempt for you to identify, to bring yourself out of the practice. Because by meditating, you're trying to turn the ego off. It knows that. It's saying, oh yeah, you think you're going to get rid of me? What about this? I haven't thought about this in a while, have you? Or here's something to really bother you. Or here's something to get you worried about. And all these thoughts start flooding in. Okay, the key is to not identify with them. Eventually, the ego is persistent, but it's really lazy. Eventually, it just gives up. It just gets tired of trying to get your attention. It says, ah, fine, forget it then. And that's the point where the mind becomes quiet and we can liberate the essence. Okay? Another benefit for meditation is attending group practices, what we do here every Thursday when you come. Um, use all opportunities to practice. Groups give you more strength, right? Because with more people, we're, we're raising and working with more energies. Okay? Uh, attending group practices is helpful because it, you know, in a group practice, you have no choice but to keep meditating. Okay, in a group practice, you can't stop until I basically say it's done, right? You can't say, well, I wonder if it's been long yet. Oh, it was only a few minutes. Oh, well, maybe I'll we'll do more later. Okay, which is the kind of thing we have at home. If you're coming to a group to do a practice, you can't put that off. You can't say, well, I'll med maybe I'll wash the dishes first. Or I'll meditate, I'll sit down and watch about an hour TV, then I'll meditate. Next thing you know, you haven't really done anything the entire night. One of the benefits of coming to a group practice is that you're here. You know, you've got no distractions here. You, you, the rest of your family's not here. Some of your family will be here, but the rest of your family's not here, and phones aren't here, and all that stuff to distract you is not here. You've got nothing else to do other than practice, and somebody else is leading it, so you don't have to worry about the time and all that kind of stuff. You just go with the flow of just partake in the energy of the group. Which brings us to the practice that we're going to do tonight. Uh, this is a really interesting one. This is, this, is, this is my favorite practice. It doesn't have to be your favorite practice, but it's my favorite practice. And we'll spend a bit of time doing this one tonight, because this is a, a pretty interesting mantra. This practice is a fairly powerful one as well. Most people usually really like this one. Uh, it's a Tibetan mantra. And if we translate what you see here, this is what it's saying. It's saying, gone, gone, gone to the other shore or the other side completely gone to the other shore or side. Enlightenment and then swaha is an expression of religious fervor. It's like a hail or a hallelujah or something like that. Okay, now this is an interesting mantra because it's, it's, it's mantralized, but it's almost kind of like a song. It's almost done like a chant as opposed to the mantras we've been doing in previous weeks that have been long and drawn out. We repeat this over and over again like a chant. And it kind of goes something like this. Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasangate, Bodhi, Swaha. Let's do that little chant. We do it over and over again. But as we do it, what we're going to do is we're going to become quieter and quieter and quieter until it's barely just a whisper. And then after that, we remain completely quiet and just repeat the mantra in our mind. Okay? When we get to the quiet section, it's important to remember you're supposed to still be saying the mantra in your mind. Okay? There's a real inclination just to stop talking and then stop doing the mantra. Okay? You're going to keep that breathing slow, deep, and rhythmic, and you're going to repeat the mantra in your mind. Okay? So we're going to start by doing it vocally for an extended period of time, and then we're just going to slowly bring the whole dynamic down. And become, each time we say it, we're going to get a little bit quieter, and a little bit quieter, and a little bit quieter, 
until it's barely just a whisper, and then it's gone completely. But when it's gone completely, vocally, it exists only in our mind. Okay? And when we get to that mental portion, you keep saying the mantra over and over again. You keep saying the sound of it in your mind and putting your entire focus on this mantra. Um, as I mentioned, this is my favorite one. It doesn't have to be your favorite one. One of the reasons why we teach so many damn practices is the idea being that everybody will find one that works for them. There's so many different people with so many different personalities. Everybody eventually will find a mantra that they really like. You can achieve a deep state of meditation with any of the practices I've shown. Okay, you just have to find one that you like and stick with it. This is one that I happened to really, really like. I don't know why. I did that one. I went, whoa, that one's really neat. And I'd done a lot of meditations before, but I thought this one was neat. So I spent some time working with it. And this is the one that I ended up getting results with the first time. Okay, that doesn't mean you will. You might like that and go, that sounds like a silly kind of chanting song. I don't like that one. I like the candle again. I don't want to make sounds in my house. People will think I'm weird. I just want to sit and stare at the candle. That's fine too. It doesn't matter. The whole purpose of this mantra is to reach the illuminated void. Okay, that's one of the reasons that it becomes a really powerful mantra. The other shore that the mantra is singing about, the other shore or other side, is the void, is the illuminated void. You can think of ourselves as being a grain of sand from that great beach, or the illuminated void is that beach from where we came. That's the other shore we have to get to, crossing that divide, crossing that abyss, to reach the point from where we came. And that's what this mantra is used to do. It's used to bring that intellectual process to a pause and draw us up into the illuminated void. And we said, yeah, start verbally, get quieter and quieter until it only is mental. And I know I've said this a couple times, but you really have to remember, when we get to that mental point, you got to keep it going in your mind. Because once you reach that point, we keep the body still and relax. No fidgeting, no shifting, no scratching itches. Okay, keep the body still, keep the mind still. The only thing that exists is the mantra. The only thing that matters is the mantra, repeating it over and over again while the physical body remains in a state of relaxation. Keep the breathing slow and deep as well, okay, because that helps keep that state of relaxation. Any questions about that? Okay, we'll take a, we'll take a short five minute break or so. Uh,